do that. We have more chairs around the corner, too. Are we ready? Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out on a, another hot <laughs> hot day in Phoenix, but by now I think we're all used to it. Um, and thank you, virtual audience, for joining us. I'm very pleased that Mark Pryor got up at 5.30 this morning in Austin, Texas, in order to get here to Phoenix so he could spend time with you all. So, was it four? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's fine. It's all the same at that <laughs> I, point. I was trying to make it slightly less horrible. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, I'm very pleased to see you again. Wonderful to be here. And I honestly don't mind getting up to come out here. This is one of my favorite trips of the year. So, well, lovely to be here. That's lovely. We went to the Royal Palms for lunch. My husband had told me that the French fries were killer, and he was absolutely correct. So, if you like French fries, I can recommend both the Valley Ho and the Royal Palms for excellent fries. Agree. Right, which I only started eating when I became lactose intolerant, and it's the one safe thing I can order, French fries and ketchup. <laughs> no dairy, so it's wonderful. Anyway, and it's very French, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Pomfrit, Pomfrit. Pomfrit. Right, any of you remember that wonderful series with the uh, Michelin Guide detective? I'm trying to think of his name. It went on forever, and he had a dog called Pomfrit. That went with him everywhere for, I'll have to look him up. It was a really long running series. And um, unsurprisingly, because he was the Michelin restaurant guy, it tended to um, penetrate restaurants in France, where apparently a lot of wrongdoing went on. Yeah, but think about the fun research for those books. It really was. Wow, that would be I great. Know. I like yeah. that. I love it. But in any case, we are, and, and many of you are here, or in fact, all of you here, probably had read the Hugo Marston books. Am I right? Right. And so a first question for Mark <laughs> will be, we discussed it at lunch, um, is that, is there any hope that you might be writing another Hugo Marston? There is hope. Um, I, I just finished the third book in the Henri, the Henri books, and uh, this was last weekend, and I was at home, and... I didn't have anything to write, and so I was kind of bouncing around the house, and my wife basically said to me, look, either you can go start a new Hugo book, or you can help with the chores. So I went to my favorite library and was noodling a new Hugo book, and I'm thinking about setting it in a, in maybe like a chocolate factory. How wonderful. I could, you know, another place I could recommend to you, because I've been there myself, is the Baccarat. Um, there's an actual, I thought it was just a firm name, but Bancara is actually the name of a village in France where they make all the glass. And I have I have a great story. You want to hear it? I, I was just thinking about somebody dying in blown glass. But yes, I do. You could do that. So if you're a tourist in France, one of the things you have to remember is the French take lunch really seriously. So things are open for you as a tourist, for example, a chateau or let's say Bancara um, from 10 or sometimes 10.30 till 12.15, or if you're lucky, 12.30, whereupon it closes and you can't get back in again till sometime after two. It's really rigid. So my husband and I were driving along and a village sign came up and it said Baccarat and I thought, oh, that can't be. And then I thought, well, I wonder if it actually is. So we zoomed off. It's now 12 o'clock and we're approaching the village and there's... Um, a museum. There's the factory in the hall bit, but there's a gorgeous museum. And I thought, I try never to miss a museum. I thought, we'll try it. So as we get there, they're closing um, and people are coming out. So I did, I put on my poor little me mask and rushed up and in my, in my broken French, I said to them that, you know, here we were just passing by. It would be our only chance ever if we could just have 15 minutes in the museum. And they said, well, madam, you can't see anything in 15 minutes. I said, <laughs> actually, I can't. I said, Professional I'm, museum I, going. I, absolutely. I said, you have no idea how well I can go. 15 minutes. So, in fact, they let us in. Didn't even charge, which is really unusual. And we did the whole thing. And as we came out, it was like 1223. And we're walking down the hill, and there is a museum store. And I lit up. And Rob, in a desperate moment, said to me, now they'll be closed. But in fact, somebody came out in the pavement saw us coming. So they held the door, and we went in. And he eventually bought me this gorgeous Baccarat necklace, which I wear sometimes. It's this beautiful piece of glass and a silver thing. And if you're going to buy it, you want to ship it, because otherwise you have to pay the 15%, you know, the 15% 
whatever it all is that we arranged all that. We managed to get that done in 12 minutes, and off we went. And some weeks later, I got a call <laughs> from FedEx in Atlanta, and they said, we have what appears to be a valuable silver artifact from France for you, and we have no idea what to charge you for customs. And I realized that they thought the glass was a big chunk of silver, and they were prepared to charge me, you know, like thousands of dollars and all. And I said to them, it's just glass. <laughs> they went, oh, okay. <laughs> and eventually sent it to me. So, you know, it was a complicated adventure, but maybe we could do something with it. Yeah, that sounds fun. I'm, I'm open to anything and everything. Right. Yeah. All sure. right. So you go just in the natal stages, but let's talk for a moment about Day Around Sundown, which is the first Henri Lefort. Yes, um, Henri was conceived right before COVID. Um, and, and fortunately for me, because I, I wrote the story and it has, it's in, in two different, it's First World War and Second World War. Um, and I had the, the timelines very distinct in the, in the initial, initial manuscript. And then I sent it to my agent and she's like, love the story, doesn't work like this. And so uh, COVID was hitting, my creativity took a nosedive except I was able to edit something I'd already written. Um, so fortunately, the, the final version, I, I, normally, I mean, you know me, but I write very quickly, and I'm, I write it and then I'm done with it and move on, but that's the only book I've taken like two years to work on. Um, and yeah, it, it, it features Henri Lefort, who is a detective in Paris, 1940. Um, and the first book he's assigned to investigate the murder of a, a, a Nazi in the Louvre Museum. Um, which is uh, something of a struggle for him because one extra dead Nazi is a good thing, right? Um, I think we all agree still that that's the case. Uh, but he has to do his job, and that's one of the themes that runs through the first two books is no matter who dies, no matter how they die, even if maybe they should, he still has to do his job. So Henri was... Um served in the first world war right yes yes and does that come into play in terms of how he does his job as a was he in the well let's not go there um <laughs> he's come out of the first world war and did he join the police right away was and and we're not going there because there's a very major plot point yeah. revol uh, the revolves around him in the first world war so I'm sorry, what was the question? Which I've already given away, unfortunately, in the write-up, <laughs> no, 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 which no. I totally for, um, I apologize. But anyway, assuming you haven't read my write-up, you will wonder <laughs> what is going on with Henri. Um, and he lives with his sister. Yes, also, yes. I guess it, we're going to assume everyone's read the first one. No, but... Oh, and if you... Uh... Okay, good. Everyone's read the first one. Here has read the not first everybody, one. Not um, everybody watching it. If you haven't, the then ignore that question. Uh, he lives with a, a young lady who, um, who actually is, he's, she's there. And her name is Nicola. Um, and for anybody who knows me personally, they know that I have three children, a uh, son called Henry, Henri, and uh, his younger sister called Nicola. Um, and as you will remember, they did not get along probably, um, for many, many years, they would butt heads and th fight each other and thump each other. So I thought, well, how fun to make them live in the same apartment just to mess with them. Um, fortunately they get on much better now. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, if you, again, if you read my Hugo series, you know that I, I like having strong, intelligent women in the books. And one of my problems with writing this series that I hadn't realized that I would come across is that in historical fiction, it's actually quite hard to have strong, intelligent, powerful, influential women. Um, just because all of the jobs, you didn't have female detectives, um, you didn't have female captains of industry, the women were housewives or... Well, but you could have them, but they weren't working. They were, you know, they were strong, intelligent women at home or in social circles rather than professional circles definitely and yeah it was just it was just something that i hadn't thought about going into writing a historical series that they would be harder to find um and and luckily for me doing research i came across um princess marie bonaparte uh, um just really shame to say it initially on wikipedia uh and then I, I got a copy of her biography and thought wow this is an incredible human being that needs to be in the book 
So Henri actually meets in the first book, Princess Marie. There's a robbery, if I remember right, and he's called to the scene. Yes, he actually ends up uh, arguably saving her life and becoming a little bit of a celebrity hero momentarily for that. Um, but more importantly, she kind of gets her hooks into him because she knows she can see there's something wrong with him, something broken in him. And the true story uh, with her is that she was fascinated by, then a student of, then a friend of, and then helped uh, Sigmund Freud escape um, uh, Austria and into England. Um, and so she was always very big into what they then called psychoanalysis, um, became a practitioner of it in, in, her, in real life. And to me, this was like the perfect mechanism for for the reader to kind of get to know Henri and explore his many many issues, um, you know, from his his trauma as a child, First World War stuff, to tell that story, um, and then to diagnose him with this condition he has, misophonia. So the Nazis have already occupied Paris. They just strolled in. Just well, hardly strolled. They rolled in. But, rolled in. Okay, um, but. Princess Marie, I mean, do they give her kind of a pass because she, you know, um, why didn't she flee? Um, historically, I don't, the problem I have with, with research is that I soon forget it and then I change it. So, for example, I, I, I know it's terrible. People, and somebody's going to trip me up on this. I know it. Somebody's going to read that book and be like, well, actually, Picasso was not in Paris on that particular date. And my response to that will be, I don't care. Um, you know, I, uh, and so with, with Marie, uh, Mimi, as we call her in the book, um, I don't even remember if that was her real nickname either. Um, benefits of old age, you forget things and then you don't care that you've forgotten things. Um, but I, I think generally, the, 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 from the research I did, my impression is the way it worked in, when the Germans first got there was um, they weren't super oppressive except to some people. Like they, they maintained, they wanted to maintain this aura of, no, we're the benign invaders and we're going to be nice to you and, yeah, we're going to eat all your food and you're not going to have any food, but we'll be polite to you in the street. Um, and so to people like her, who has privilege and, and money and connections, yeah, they're going to be nicer to her than they are to to some shopkeeper. Yeah. Right. So, you know, despite all the things that they did that were terrible, they didn't actually destroy a lot of Paris, and with great luck, jumping ahead, when they left, they didn't blow it up, which everybody feared that they would, but um, but they didn't, or we would not have, you know, the Paris that that we know today. Yeah, and that's, you know, people often ask me, why do I set my books in Paris? Um, and and it's because I love the city, and one of the reasons I love, love the city, it's one of the few cities in Europe that's the same, essentially the same today as it was 100 years ago, or even just pre, pre-war. I think the Franco-Prussian War did more damage to Paris than, than the Nazis did. Yeah, and, you know, the Nazis, they, they valued Paris. They had that, I can't remember the policy was, that every soldier got to have a trip to Paris, got to have one vacation in Paris, because they valued the Paris as, as it was. So I, I have to think that's why they, there was some reluctance to explode it on the way in and on the way out. Um, I think, actually, Hitler had ordered it destroyed, and the guy that was in charge ignored him by the time the or if I remember this right um, that the whoever the commandant was in charge of Paris overruled Hitler and um, good for him yeah exactly <laughs> uh, well by then I think it was fairly clear that Hitler was on his way out and it wouldn't be so dangerous yeah. to ignore you know his yeah. order so we'll see anyway we're fortunate that Paris survived but we're now we're in 1940 and die around sunset where have we progressed to in the dark edge of night? Well, I'm wanting this to be a long-lasting series, and I want to write it chronologically, so we're not very far along, uh, time-wise. That's the great thing about historical fiction. You can start the next case the day after yeah, and the I'm first pretty... one. Nobody's asking you to age it in real time. I know. I don't want to because I don't want to run out of World War II, which is a phrase nobody ever said before. Um, uh, no, that's not true, because <laughs> I've talked to other authors like Reese Bowen, who doesn't want to get to the war. So she's creeping her way through the 1930s, so she doesn't have to get into World War II, because then it would be... It's like people who are writing Edwardian age. You know, they all want to stop in, like, 1913, because, you know, it's gone. When we get to August of... August, actually, of, of 1914, that whole beautiful Gilded Age, you know, 
goes away. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So you want to creep your story along unless you want to run out of Yeah, time. so so this is the first book is is 1940. The second one happens, I think, right before Christmas. Um, and so the third one, which like I say, I've just finished, is uh, New Year's Eve. <laughs> so so I'm 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 thinking I can get like a six books a year in. And make it last another four years. So yeah, I'm I'm being optimistic. Maybe Henri's going to be fairly exhausted if he <laughs> just managed to get right. Just yeah. got to Christmas, and now it's New Year's Eve, and yet another crime. Well, but the thing is that under the occupation, there would have been a constant stream of crime. If so, you know, it wouldn't be so improbable that he would finish a case around Christmas and then get another one. Yeah, by New Year's Eve. That's true. Although I I have this this sort of juxtaposition of. A lot of the people who commit crimes are young men, but a lot of them were no longer in Paris, right? Because of the Germans shipping them off or they were at war or whatever. Uh, but on the other hand, there were, there were a few uh, detectives too. So he's, um, in, in the one I've just finished, there's a, there's a murder right outside his building. And because he was drunk and sleeping, he didn't hear anything. So his boss is like, well, in that case, you can investigate it, even though it's in, outside his building. So... Um, yeah, I, I think I think I can have as many crimes as I want and have. Oh, yeah, I mean, actually, wartime policing is a really um, an interesting subject. Years ago, I'm trying to remember the author's name. A book called Blackout, um, wonderful book, and it is about um, a policeman in London trying to be a policeman in London during the war. For some reason, might have been an injury or something. He is not serving, you know, in the army, and so he is performing as a cop and how how really difficult that was and people would come up to him and you know harass him um about why he wasn't in the service i don't remember what kind of injury he had and all but you know that was true i think somebody else wrote a really good book about detroit during the war and how there weren't enough people to be cops or anything you know uh, because they were either working on the assembly lines because detroit was a major manufacturer for the war or they were off in Europe and so the criminals such as there were could run amok. Yeah and and for Henri it's even more difficult because the normal chain of command has kind of been extended or or bifurcated because he has his boss but especially when he's investigating the murder of a German then he has to report to the Germans too and they are considerably less patient um, and so yeah that that just makes it even more complicated. I just remembered his name. Who was it? John Lawton, L-A-W-T-O-N, a book okay. called Blackout. Proving once again that just because you're old, your memory doesn't fail you. It just it just takes longer to, to access whatever memory it is. I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> no, it's true. You know, um, Well, you're all used to me not being able to recall titles and stuff. But uh, it is. It, I've always remembered it because I thought that that, that was such a... A topic we don't think about all that much you know if all the men are off fighting and you know most of the women who are um, able to are working and all who's looking after everybody else well whatever criminals there are many of whom might be juveniles actually rather because not old enough to serve or something are running crazy in the streets and yeah. it means it's a major wartime problem that we don't tend to think about yeah and, and a, lo a lot of the the younger cops that that are involved with Henri. I mean, he he notes two and two or three in in the first couple books that they look like they're children, like they're just that you know. Did you decide to come to police station instead of elementary school today just because they look so young? Um, so what what is what is happening? The instigating incident here. You've already sort of mentioned it, but you have to look it up to remember it. <laughs> no, that, not at all. No, I just uh, it's refreshing my recollection. It's so crazy how you forget what you what you write. Um, yeah, so this is a this is another this is a missing persons case initially, uh, but there's also a body that's found um, in in an apartment that is not clear whether it was natural death, whether it was robbery, whether it was murder, and. Um, there is also an element of uh, disappearing children, um, and and the the women in his life, Nicola and Mimi, are very concerned about this because the women of Paris are coming to them saying, you know, you have power, you you know, cops, can you investigate these missing kids? And um, uh, Henri is is 
being told by these Germans, no, you have to find this missing Nazi. And then his boss is saying, no, you have to solve this murder. And so he's telling his, you know, the, the women that are the most important to him in his life, uh, just, you know, take a back seat. I'm sure everything's fine. I'm sure everything's fine. Of course, everything's not fine. Um, and the stories end up kind of winding together. Who's the missing German? The missing German is a doctor who has recently arrived from, from Germany and is taking uh, as one of three doctors who is leading a particular um, research program at a hospital in Paris. More than that, I should not say. No, you really shouldn't. Talk to us a little bit about Rin, because um, Rin, R-E-N-N-E-S, is a city, um, what is it, towards... Um... Just west. I think yeah. It's like northwest. Um, yeah, I mean, really, that was a, that was a, a city of convenience. I went in somewhere not too far, um, somewhere he could get to easily. Um and somewhere I've never been, actually. I, I yeah, no, I haven't. I, I haven't been there. I've been to quite a few places in, in front. And usually I go somewhere when I'm when I'm going to put it in a book. That makes me think I should go there, although it's a bit late now. Since it's out. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, yeah, there there's train service to Ren, um, and so, you know, it it just keeps cropping up somehow in the investigation. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Um and it's one of those things where um in in the good old days pre-war it would have been real easy for him to investigate to take off and do his job. But because of the pressures of of multiple investigations and different different pressures from different different authority figures, um it takes him a while to cotton on that that Ren is an important city in this investigation. Um and then when he goes there um Bad things happen to him for a minute or two, but that's okay. Kind of like Donna Leon occasionally leaves Venice to move over onto the mainland, and it never is good news when <laughs> that happens for Commissario Brunetti. Um, right. So, you know, Paris is is the main location, but in fact, France had a decent railroad system, Le Train Bleu, that went down south towards the Riviera and so forth. Um, and today you can still, you know, Probably a lot more easily now. Zip around France. It's it's incredible. The last time I was there, um, we we, I guess we were with the kids, and you can just or not, it doesn't matter. The kids are relevant. Um, you can just get on a train in Paris and be in London in two hours. Um, and I tell people this when they when if you're thinking of going, um, go first class because it's not that much more expensive, and you get a meal. I mean, you don't have to buy food on the train. Or when you get to the station, which is very expensive. Hasn't Brexit slowed that down? Uh, it didn't when we were there last. No, it was mm. still. I mean, you have I to... thought they were having a lot of trouble with the channel. With um, maybe that's just the truckers and the it's the freight. The French not striking, the people. probably the sheep right. farmers. Isn't Ren the capital of Brittany? Now that I think about it, I think it might be. Yes. If there are no follow-up questions or nobody who knows any more, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I've... Probably sure. I mean, in other words, it's an important city. It's not just a small town in France, but yes. it's actually a department um, capital. I have never been there either, but I really want to go to Brittany. And any of you read the Jean Luc Banalek series, which I absolutely, if you haven't, I can't recommend it. The first one's called A Murder in Brittany. It's one of our best selling paperback series now, um, new hardcover. And it's been on television. But weirdly enough, it's a German production with a Spanish guy who was playing. Henri Dupin, really? who is the dispatcher. Yeah, I have not figured that out. It's like Martin Walker. You know, Bruno is the German television series. And Donna Leon, Commissario Brunetti in Venice, was a German television series. And none of them looked Italian. It was so bizarre. Oh. They didn't dress like Italians. They didn't, you know. And so I don't know what it is then. I, I, um, I'm pretty sure they won't be doing my books because you don't think so. Well, the because Germans the are Germans all the bad guys. Are the bad guys right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't have Good a German point. publisher, I think, for, for the Hugo books because in the very yeah. first one, it's kind of for the Second World War Got it. Uh, flashbacks or whatever history. Right. So I'm sure they read that and they're like, nope. Actually, even more amusing, Mr. Monsieur Banilek is actually German uh, who who holidays in Brittany, but he's also an executive in your publisher. Um, oh. So, but anyway, they I, they're really wonderful, aren't they? They truly are. So, B A N N A L E C. I can't recommend them highly enough. A murder in Brittany. 
Um, it's all good if they're more French series, right? It's more than various, as as And in fact, Martin Walker's new book will be out. Uh, it is out. We'll be here next week, Murder in the Chateau. So Bruno has a new book. But Martin is not coming to November because the cookbook, finally we're going to get the cookbook. So they're going to send him with both the cookbook uh, and the 16th case for Bruno. I are know. They, are those... But but you have to, I mean, I ordered the book now because they'll mm -hmm. all be gone by November. Not the cookbook, which publishes in November, but rather the new novel. So what's the cookbook? Whose recipes? It's Bruno. These oh. are Bruno's recipes. And um, that cookbook has been in the works for I don't even know how long. And many of us have complained bitterly that <laughs> it was only in German. Um, that we couldn't get it, but now fortunately it will it will be out. So I'm thinking we might have to do something that will involve a restaurant. Yeah, I know it. I'm I'm going to think about how we're going to do this for Martin because I can come back great. in November. Can I you like do food. that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I like um, food. <laughs> well, no, one of the there. It's not. It's not a series where the recipes are in the you know that they publish them in the back like a cozy series or something but um bruno cooks and part of the joy of the book is mm -hmm. bruno's out in his garden picking the fresh lettuces right. and shooing away the rabbits and you know all that making his own wine the whole bit um but that wasn't really going to be a a big activity in 1940 Paris, is no, it? No, although they were pretty good, inventive with, with uh, the food that they had to get. I mean, you know, Mimi is, is using the black market, and um, I'm I'm noticing, this wasn't on purpose, but I'm noticing that the one thing everyone's complaining about all the time is the coffee, because I think the coffee got slowly worse and worse from, you know, stale beans to um, reused beans to re-reused beans to then just having chicory and then using shoe leather or whatever was next. Um, and it's, I think it's become kind of a running joke between Henri and Nicola now. It's like, well, what's the coffee made of this time? Well, I mean, part of the point of coffee is the taste, but a lot of the point is the caffeine. So if they're using acorns and shoe leather, the whole point of the caffeine is largely obliterated. Yeah, I suppose. I don't know how much of it is in the head. If it's a nice hot copy of a uh, hot cup of something brown, maybe. Uh... Well, the French drink a lot of what they call tisane, which yeah. are actually herbal teas of one sort or another. And I would have favored a tisane rather yeah. than really bad. I don't coffee. know how pop was that was that popular back then. I don't know. Maybe it should yeah, have been. I think so. Although I find it so interesting that New Orleans is famous for its chicory coffee. I mean, voluntarily <laughs> diluting the, the coffee. So I don't know why that would have been such a thing. You know, we, why it is such a thing. My dad did that when we were younger. I remember he would have an amount of chicory in his coffee. And I don't, I don't know if it's a Swiss thing, but we used to spend a lot of time in Switzerland growing up. And I remember him doing it there. So maybe, maybe it was a thing. Back, maybe even it a holdover a from the, maybe yeah, a holdover, maybe yeah, because he was got used to hickory. I mean, yeah, to chicory yeah, is yeah. a wartime deal. Uh, and, that could and, that could well be. I mean, he was of that generation that it, it, it could have been a holdover. You know, that that's something that um, is really important when you're writing books set in the war is how hard it was to get food and what really wretched diets people had. Do you remember Reese Bowen's book before the new one that just came out, the Paris Sun, the one before that? Was set, a woman was evacuated from London to a village, and the lengths that they went through, even in the country, to find anything to eat with rationing and the whole bit was just extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, the problem was always that it was, well, multiple, multiple problems. I mean, the supply lines, um, food coming in from the, farm, from the farms was purloined by the Germans, um, and any time there was a store with anything in it, people would know, and they'd queue, and they'd, they'd fight to get it, and um and yeah so people had to get inventive they had to people like Mimi had to pay money um yeah it's 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 it makes you wonder how fragile our current supply lines are and i guess we saw it a little bit too right with covid that Not a lot in COVID, yeah the, yeah the we supply did. lines were extremely stretched yeah it doesn't it actually doesn't take that much so imagine a a world war it's kind of Sobering. That's part of the problem for the ukrainians i mean they don't have enough to eat and with the black sea blockade and the grain, because Ukraine was the breadbasket of so much of the world, yeah. there are going to be people all over who aren't going to have enough to eat, you yeah. know, if the blockades continue. So, yeah. you know, feeding people is a, a major... Yeah, and, and that was... always disrupted in wartime. That was a huge part of the, of the resentment that the French had towards the Germans. It wasn't just taking their apartments and strolling through the museums. And the, it was... They would buy all the clothes and they would eat. I mean, they called one of the nicknames they had was Mange 2 
um, which is the uh, snap pea, but it also means eat everything. Literally, is the French translation it means eat everything. And that's they so they called the Germans the mange too because they would just come in and they would eat all the food and they had they had no cares. Very true. And they stayed at the Ritz and hung out with Chanel. And, Absolutely. you know, meantime, the French were hiding their wine. I mean, you know, the wine caves in much of France, they were doing their... And um, if you read All the Light You Cannot See, which is about to be a film, you know that they evacuated much of the art from the Louvre and all and hid it. You know, of course, the, the British did that too. Most of it went to whales and coal mines That's from right. the National Gallery and so forth. So we're lucky so much of it survived. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. It was, yeah, it's just, it's weird writing that time. I, I have to, I have some of my characters, particularly Henri, is quite flippant a lot of the time. Um, and I sometimes have to rein it in a bit because I have to remind myself, look, some of this stuff wasn't really very funny. I mean, it was, it was bad. It was, it was bad. And for somebody like him who has a rich friend, maybe it wasn't that bad. Um, but, but for a lot of people, it, it was, and it happened so quickly too. I mean, just in a matter of months, people went from living their normal lives to their kids being shipped off to, to some work camp in Germany and them having no food on the table. Yeah, the invasion was, was very rapid, and you know the French had a misplaced confidence in the Maginot Line, which was just a joke because the Germans just went around it. They didn't have to go through it. Um, sort of drew the Great Wall of China, you know. Um, anytime anybody, a lesson we apparently failed to learn under the last administration, anytime that you put up a wall, people just find a way around it. Over, you know? under, or around right. it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The the thing that suffers with the wall at our border is really the the lot, you know, the animals more than more than people because animals aren't so good at figuring out ways around it. In fact, the Aswan Dam in Egypt has had the same effect because it, you know, bifurcates the Nile, and the crocodile and the hippopotamus and other populations that used to go up and down the river can't do that now. And I've, so it's been a real problem. Um, yeah, I've never seen a hippo on a ladder. I can imagine that's difficult. <laughs> no. Um, right. It is crocodiles in Egypt, alligators in Florida. Yeah. Right? <laughs> to try to keep that one in mind, right? They're not the same thing. Right. So anyway, um, this, this the, the, what's really going on in the background, which we can't discuss, was a true thing um, that the Nazis were doing. So, you know. Um, Should we discuss it without discussing it? <laughs> we, can't, we, can. we can't really discuss it without spoiling the plot. But they, they were up to a number of um, malign... Pro well, they called it science, but they were up to a number of really um, inhumane projects, um, and yeah. you know. Um, yeah, and I and again, it's it's amazing how many times I grew up in England, where everyone was always obsessed with World War One, and particularly World War Two, and you know, movies nonstop and comics and everything. And so, growing up, and you know, my my family lived in a village, and the. the plane had crashed in a nearby field you know, so we were just inundated with world war ii things and i was fascinated with it growing up and read everything about it and, and it's astounding to me that now at the age of 27 um i'm still learning liar <laughs> all right 31 um i'm still learning new things like i, I read about that program just a couple of years ago and it blew my mind i'm like this is so unbelievable how do i not know, do not know there's a character um who appears in in the dark edge of night uh whose name is virginia hall who i don't know if anybody's familiar with she is a u.s woman and i had never heard of her until about two years ago when my mother said to me hey you need to read this book called a woman of no importance um and it's about a a an american woman um who wanted to be a diplomat and of course she couldn't because she was a woman um, she kept trying, kept trying, and at some point she, she was from money, and so she came over to Europe and was hunting, and as you do, she shot her own foot off. Um, but that didn't slow her down, and she ended up becoming a spy uh, for the French, and then became essentially the most wanted person by the Nazis in France, and so she escaped on foot, literally, because she only had one, through the Pyrenees Mountains, got back to Britain, was debriefed and signed up by the SOE, I think they're called, the British spies, and then was like, okay, well, you, now you go back to France and be one of our spies. And, and this incredible human being who until three, four, five years ago, I'd never even heard of. And I, I'm like, 
How is that possible? How is it possible this? Well, there were a lot of reasons. Part of it was the, you know, Secrets Act, um, or people, and also people really didn't talk about it. It was not a confessional time. Yeah, that's true. And, and it, you know, it just as much reading as I've done now on this, it just, it, it, you think of it as being World War II and everyone went through World War II, but it, it's much clearer to me now that every single human being went through a different World War II. They each had their own one. And for some people, it was it was worse than others, and some it was better. It depended on where you were. It depended <laughs> on how old you were. Yeah. It depended on um, your economic status, on your health, and but it was a world war. Yeah, it well, absolutely it, was. And so, and so, of course, it, it seems super obvious and kind of stupid to say that everybody had their own experience. But sometimes, when you look at the movies, you sort of think of it as this monolithic experience where this battle happened, and then this battle happened, and then Hitler killed himself, and that was the end of it. But but every single human being, no matter where, yeah, like you say, depending on where you were and where your circumstances, had a had an entirely different experience, and and those stories are still being told. Actually, with great frequency, there's a whole entire literary genre about World War II stories, you know, coming out. Many of them women's stories. We found out that those strong, independent women and all, they were actually there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, they weren't in command. It was Montgomery in Africa or something. But there, were, women were doing really important things, and um, and the genie didn't go back in the bottle all that easily when the war was over. Thank heavens for that. Yeah, it yeah. was a big advance yeah. for women, yeah. really. So yeah, yeah. it was great. <laughs> yeah. Right. So all right. So we make it. Well, you do know that Henri survives because we know that he's going to appear here in the next book. And we won't talk about anybody else. So any of you have questions that you'd like to ask? The wine that you were considering, is that a real wine you put in there or one you made up? Chateau Petrus? Yes. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Go to a wine store, ask for a bottle, bring it to me, and we'll try it. And then you tell me how real it is. <laughs> After you take out a small loan in order to buy it. <laughs> yeah. It does. And and in, in fact, in the new book, she, she serves him something and she apologizes because she can no longer get her hands on uh, Petrus. And, and just to be clear, I've never tasted it yet myself. Maybe next lunchtime. <laughs> I'll buy you some, right? It's, I, I, think it's, I think it's from Bordeaux. Anyway, it's, yeah. a, it's a red wine, and I think it's from the Bordeaux region. But very, anyway, very it's fresh. a very famous uh, vintage. That's a really, would Parisians think of Henri as being a collaborator? That's a really good question, and it's one that I struggle with pretty much on the page in, in these two books, and I'm sure every book, um, because, because yes, right, he's doing their bidding. Like he, a German is dead, every over here once German's dead, his job is to investigate murders. Um, he tells himself, and I think he's, he's correct, that he's, he's never... Uh, focused or troubled by or, or, or uh, influenced by the the person who's dead, like wh what they did for a living, what kind of human being they were, um, and this is my experience as a as a prosecutor um, who's handled uh, dozens of murder cases. You don't you don't pick and choose. Oh, this person was a scumbag. We're not going to bother prosecuting this case. That's a very, that's a, you and I are going to have a quick chat after this. That's a, the question was, uh, I don't know if they can hear the question. The, the, what if he comes across somebody who was murdered by a member of the resistance? I mean, that is, that is a plum uh, uh, problem for him to have in a future book. Let's put it that way. Um, because, because he, yeah, you're right. I mean, on the one hand, by, by investigating and solving, what if a really good person killed that horrible Nazi? Like, and his position would be that's, you know, I did my job. I'm paid to do my job. Everyone knows that's my job. I'm doing my job. Um, but but if if you're the family of the good person who killed the nasty Nazi, you're like, really, dude? Um, especially when, you know, in, in this time, thousands, tens of thousands of people were dying for no reason. Good people were dying for no reason. Yeah. 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 You're out after curfew, you get shot. 
uh, and 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 Henri wouldn't get to investigate that, right? Because that's not really a murder. That's the in the eyes of the authorities, the new authorities, that's legitimate killing. Um, so. And that's an added complication for this time, right? You you don't just have the moral ambiguity of, um, am I collaborating by by solving this murder? Your you, you uh, Henri in this case has the added com complication of, well, if I don't, do I go pay a visit to Madame Guillotine? And and so you know, and the Germans obviously play into that self interest or self self preservation. Um, and it's and it's this is what makes that period so fascinating to me, is what normal human beings, which is what he is. Um, he's not a saint. He's not a, a bad person. It's the the dilemmas that he faces that none of us have to face, or if we do, they're not certainly to that to that extent. And and maybe that makes it more forgivable if he does something we wouldn't choose. Uh, but it's as a writer, it's just so interesting to explore. Because it could go so many different ways. Some 25 years ago, there was a Canadian author who wrote a really fascinating series about um, a French cop and a German cop who was in occupied Paris. And they had to solve crimes together. Um, and it really was, I, they were very difficult to read sometimes. He was a serious overplotter. So you could be exhausted <laughs> trying to read one of the books. But nonetheless, it was an amazing dilemma. And that could happen to Henri. Supposing somebody is murdered and the Germans assign an investigator, and then he is assigned, and the two of them have to work together um, to solve the crime. Yeah, and, and Henri has gotten used to working by himself, um, solving these things. I mean, he has ostensibly a partner, and I mentioned him a couple of times, but there's a guy who's not, he's not interested in working. He has asthma, Albert Durand, at the beginning of the first book. He's like, I'm not, I'm not going to this robbery murder scene because it's too far and I'm not walking over there. And so Henri's like, fine, I'll do it. But absolutely, I mean, I can, I can definitely see a, a future book where, where that happens. And, 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 and I'm sure it did happen. Oh, I'm sure. Especially the more important, the victim, right? I'm sure. Yeah, that, that could be a, another fun There was almost a witch hunt, and there were a, a, it. It actually, in many cases, uh, went after women who had, you know, yeah. slept with or had relationships. Well, you know, sexual relationships almost always um, with Germans, um, and that was um, pretty brutal. But there were certainly men. But you know, the thing is, there were a lot of people who actually weren't in the resistance who later claimed they were in the resistance or came to it very late. So it was awfully hard to know who was legitimately um yeah that's, was, and who was a collaborator now the lines were pretty blurry and that's exactly what i was going to say also is true it, in italy i might add the same problem very much and especially in northern italy huge discussion about you know whether somebody was just trying to save his farm or you know whatever it was or whether he was an actual collaborator and you know the women who were involved in it some of whom were raped and you know dragged off some of whom went voluntarily I mean, you know, it was all, the, the lines are all so blurry. Yeah, and how do you define collaborator? Is it the waiter who serves a meal to the German Nazi? I mean, well, I think that's an easy no. But where do you draw the line? And well, I think, look at Chanel. She got away with it. You know, there's yeah. no question that Chanel, you know, collaborated, yeah. or, you know, hobnob with, dressed, all the rest of it. The Germans, somehow she got a piss. Yeah. All, you know, all the, incredibly, I think, but she did. Yeah, and and it's those it's those earthy questions that I like in the book I'm right that I just finished. Um, there is just, that becomes one of the the questions. There is a character in there who, out of self preservation rather than selfishness, or or what you would think of as certainly not moral collaboration, didn't it was just a question of survival. Does some things, and it's it's on the one hand it's easy to judge from this distance, but also it's super hard because I don't know what I would do. I'm sure I'd be perfect, but uh, I don't know what you would do. 
You, know, you wrote one of your Hugo Marson books that was set down in, maybe it was the wine country, but anyway, out in the Chateau country. And these problems arose during the French Revolution. And, you know, same difficulty is um, what side was who on when. And, you know, if you went from somebody storming the Bastille to like Robespierre and then suddenly Napoleon came along and it was all different, it was pretty dizzying, you know, switching sides and working out who to support and it's not and it's not uh you're exactly yeah and it's not a it's not a question of uh well it's monday nine o'clock it's time to decide which side i'm on it's it's somebody shows up at your doorstep and asks you a question and and which way do you go do yeah you, well it was in your in the, one of your ego do you remember which one Did you uh, blood remember? promise maybe I don't remember, but one of the Hugo Marsons, if you recall, he was in a chateau, not in Paris, in this these questions. Blood but promise. it was a, an eighteenth, you know, it was a a problem that went all the way back to the eighteenth century, yeah, rather than contemporary. Yeah. So no, yeah, I mean, so you know, the history history is always with you, um, in in you know countries there civilization goes back a really long time, and that's an un- we're beginning to find it here with. Um, you know, indigenous people and so forth. Yeah. We're beginning to find that our history is a lot older than we tend to think it is. Yeah, yeah, that was an unintentional uh, theme of all the most of the Hugo books was history never goes away. Yeah, I mean, she she makes an appearance in this book, um, and oh, we'll get to it. <laughs> no, and and I'm going to give a bit away because I just find it I, I just find it amusing. I thought it was funny at the time. It was one of those times I started writing something. I would tickle to myself pink with it. So they're at a cafe together. Well, he's at a cafe, take having a coffee or whatever, and relaxing, Henri. And then this this woman sits down next to him, and and he feels something brushing his shin, and he's like, oh. And, and he's getting a bit embarrassed by it. And then so he kind of does <clears throat> a bit of that back. Um, and then he thinks, you know, he's onto something. And then it's only about, you know, 20 minutes later when she, she adjusts her fake leg that he realizes she had no idea what she was doing. He was playing footsie with somebody who couldn't feel it. <laughs> so I, I amuse myself sometimes. Well, you know, Josephine Baker, the American singer, uh, was an um, active agent during Martin Walker and the Bruno books. Um, she, She's not alive, but, you know, her legacy, she had a chateau in the Dordogne. Um, she was very active. So there were people, you know, women who were playing big roles. Yeah. Absolutely no, yeah, definitely. It's just it's just fun for me to discover them because growing up, I was always told of the of the macho men doing all the shooting and you know um, inglorious bastards type stuff. Not not these incredibly brave women who had way less support than the men did. And something like only twenty five percent of those women who were dropped from Britain dropped into France to support the resistance. Only twenty five percent of them lived. Almost all of them died. I mean, it was a just a tremendous yeah. Um, yeah. Death rate, you know, you had to be really brave. It was almost like a suicide mission to brave, be, yeah, brave and to lucky. agree to it. Yeah, yeah, right. and, and that's the other thing. I, you know, one of the one of the other things I'm exploring for the third book, and and to some degree for Dark Edge of Night, is the resistance, um, which again in 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 TV and movies is typically portrayed as this uh, this one force that goes around doing these various things, and then the more you read about it, the more you see that it was just this disparate groups of individuals who had totally different motivations, totally different philosophies. It was guerrilla warfare. It was guerrilla warfare, but it was so disorganized, especially at the beginning. Um, and I, I had no idea. I just, I didn't, I didn't realize it was six people over here putting out a newsletter and, and nine people over there wanting to blow up trains and they would fight with each other because they each thought the other was useless. Um, and it's you know, it was small pockets, right? Yeah. And it was only gradually when the tide of war began to turn and more people as I said, there were a lot of people who claimed to have been in resistance after the war then, you know, if they if they were at all, they were latecomers to but, the scene. And that's the inverse question of who was a collaborator, right? What does it mean to resist? 
Um, is it is it not an answering the door when a German comes knocking looking for milk? I mean, maybe. Um, is it is it a policeman refusing or or doing a terrible job? Maybe to answer your question, uh, is it a policeman who investigates the death of a Nazi and is like, no, no idea who did it when they do? Is that that maybe maybe he's a resistance member too because he's not. Yes. We're going to face this whole dilemma when the Ukraine war finally settles down because it's going to be really difficult to sort out, you know, the roles of the various people involved in the combat, Russian, Ukrainian, and all kinds of other people. Yeah. In fact, Brad Thor's most recent thriller involved an American woman, a lawyer from Chicago, who went over to help the Ukrainians and uh, in an orphanage, and then the Russians, the Wagner, the Wagner group, took the orphanage and took her and took her prisoner, and that's why his hero, Scott Harbath, is sent in there to rescue her, and it goes on from oh, there. Yikes. Yeah. So, but I mean, you know, that's that's not atypical of people to insert themselves into conflicts and, you know... And then change the narrative afterwards. <laughs> well, um, or, or, you know, it's like the... You know, what was with the American soldier that walked into North Korea? You know, he was up for discipline and he apparently thought that he'd had a better deal in North Korea than if they said... But, you know, now it's a question of do we go get him or, you know, how do, or, or do we just let the North Koreans have him? And did he have any valuable information? Probably not uh, to trade. But, I mean, what do you do about people like that? Yeah, I don't know. Thank you for that. Thank you for another question. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, yeah. It, it, the, I think the question is: Is Henri going to come across somebody who is essentially hiding their true nature? Um, and and yeah, in 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 one of the books, I think maybe the one I just finished, he's asked to go on a raid, um, and he refuses to do it. Not, I mean, he comes up with a different excuse, and but he essentially refuses. Um, and that's you know that's that was a moving target too, right? They they start with. And it's the same with fascists everywhere. They start with one group and they eat through those and then they go for the next target group and then they keep going. Um, and so initially it's, it's the people who are obviously Jewish and they take their houses and they take their property and they take, their, take them. Um, but then they come for the people, you know, two years later who are not quite so obviously Jewish but are. Um, and so again, that's, a, that's definitely a, a, uh, a, an area to explore with of moral complexity, although it's not that complex f from this distance. But when you have a man who's supposed to be a lawman upholding the law, um, how far is he going to push that to um, maybe protect somebody who he is not supposed to protect? It's fascinating. Yeah, and what I'm seeing, um, and again, I hate to keep referring to the book I just wrote, but because it, it, it's fresh in my mind, I guess I'm going to. Um, what becomes very apparent is that if you can have a, a brave moral stance and you can say, no, I put my foot down, I'm not doing that, and then the Nazis will come and they will torture your best friend or your wife or your child. And so you're right, it's life or death, but it's not just for you. Um, there becomes a situation where Henri has to make a decision that, you know, he knows if it goes the wrong way, pretty much everybody in his building is done for. Um, it's all a village in France, the name of which I can't remember, which I have been to where that happened and the Nazis actually destroyed the entire village, killed everybody. Yeah. In it. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, you, you mentioned before about 
the retaliation thing. I mean, it was it was it was something that happened in Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. when Heinrich was assassinated. Yeah. You know, they they yeah. did that. So yeah. Um, but you know, there's an additional complication in regard to to the Jewish issue, which is there was a very strong streak of anti-Semitism in the French. And if you read Kara Black's, Black's book, for example, Murder in the Marais, you read a lot of French people turned in their own fellow citizens because they were greedy to get their property or their, you know, their money or whatever it is. So it wasn't always, I mean, the Nazis were, you know, there to execute it, but it wasn't always the Nazis that, you know, preyed upon them. It was the French who then turned them over to the Nazis. So yeah. it was a really miserable era. No, it was. And and again, with the book I just finished, um, uh, uh, I should have. I should have. I do have it. It's in the hotel, actually, and I'm, I'm meditating. But but one of one of the, yeah, that's exactly what what one of the main plot lines is. Um, these they were called corbeau, which is the French word for a crow. But it would be there were poison pen letters that French people would send to the authorities, saying, "Oh, my neighbor is using the black market or whatever it is," and they would do it just because they wanted to take that neighbor's apartment, or because two years earlier that neighbor. Neighbors' kids had broken a window and they yeah, refused to pay for it. There was a grudge thing or a greed thing or a lot that went on. But I mean, you know, if you know your French history, you could go back to the Dreyfus affair, and yeah. you know, there's there's been it's been a real problem. And the Spanish were much more tolerant, aside from the Inquisition. But um, <laughs> you know, they Forget were that. they were more blended with. Yeah, you know, French. The French have always been difficult. And still remain that way, but they are wonderful. Just are, right. Hi, any of you watching? <laughs> Adios, Frances. Here we go. Right. Well, I think we've probably tortured you enough here with all this. Does anybody have a final killer question they would like to ask? No? Oh, yes. The restaurant that they'd like to go to, they put the Jewish star in the window and they weren't Jewish. And why did they went ahead and put it up when they hadn't been told they had to? I uh, next time I come, I want a warning that nobody's to ask me about facts or plot points or s characters. Well, you could have read names. the book on the plane. <laughs> 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 there was a, you know what? Here's what I'm going to say. There was an extremely good reason for that. That's the prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Who's now a defense attorney and yeah, learning a right. whole new deal? Right. Um, right. So thank you, Mark. It's really been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming this yes. afternoon. Thank you. Really yes, appreciate it. Thank you, virtual audience, for joining us. And we do have copies of The Dark Edge of Night and Day Around Sundown that Mike Mark will be signing here momentarily. So bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.